Hello, everyone. Welcome to the International Documentary Association screening series. We are really glad to have you here uh, this morning, this evening, wherever your time zone is. Um, my name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Assistant Director of Public Programs and Events here at the International Documentary Association. Um, before we get started, I would like to offer uh, a land acknowledgement. Um, today I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, which is on the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this land for generations. I would also like to offer um, some thanks to our sponsors. First off, IndieWire uh, for helping, <clears throat> excuse me, to bring the screening series to you uh, this year. We're really excited. Uh, we've got a few more left this month, so stay tuned. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, KCRW for their support. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to hand this off to Eric. We have a conversation here around Gunda, uh, moderated by IndieWire's Eric Cohn. So Eric, uh, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation. There have been so many great documentaries as a part of this series, but this one I think really stands in a class of its own because there are so many films made about problems in the world or designed to raise awareness about issues that are often too complex for people to understand on their own terms. But what Gunda does in such a unique and cinematic fashion is it puts you inside the world of animals to deliver a kind of empathy that we've never really seen before in, at the movies. And that is why I go to film festivals. It's why I chase the latest and greatest movies out there is to see things as I've never seen them before. So it's, it's just so thrilling to, see, to experience what this filmmaker has pulled off here. And it gives me great pleasure of welcoming him now. So uh, Victor Kosakowski is here and I'm gonna bring him into the conversation. Victor, thank you for being here. Hi. Hi. And um, it's, so, it's so exciting to talk about this movie because of the way in which it is designed to have an impact beyond simply the sort of artistic ambition in play, although there is certainly that. And I wanted to start off by talking about that aspect of it, the activist roots of the project. Obviously before this film, you had made a film that was about a very different subject with Aquarella, which is about water. So how do you go from water to pigs? <laughs> yeah, I started at the same time. It's, it's, uh, the beginning was very, very long ago. I started, this idea came to me uh, when I was in 97, in 97. So I, I presented a film Wednesday in the Berlin Film Festival. I got the press prize and journalists asked me what will be next. If you have all money you want, what you would do? I said, I would do Trinity about chicken, pigs, and cow. And okay, people were just smiling and no one took it seriously. So then it took me 20 years to, to find someone who can trust this idea. And um, so I met a uh, uh, Norwegian producer, Anita Rehok Larsen, who said, okay, let's talk about it. Uh, and then uh, Jocelyn Barnett, so she also started helping us. So it, it took me a lot of years to convince people that it could be an interesting subject. But you're right that uh, Water was before, and it, before Water was from even Los Antipodes, when I start to change myself radically. So when I start making even Los Antipodes, it happened that even I was planning to make Film, film people, suddenly, wherever I go, animals, landscape, start playing a very important role. And in the end of the film, I came to conclusion that why my life is more important than life of butterfly or life of elephant or life of whale, why? Why, why I'm so exceptional? If they live on this planet longer than us, why we believe that Everything is for us. Okay, 
in in Greek, uh, in antique, in two thousand years ago, they were saying uh, human is the measure of everything. Okay, then Bible was saying same mistake that in the first page that everything for human and human supposed to rule all of this. Okay, but then of course long time of tradition to focus on human and art actually all art goes focus on human but i still believe it's mistake i if you we we human we can live only five days without water right so if if uh, and it's absurd even without plants we can we can live only two months all, all of us human and animal will die if there are no plants Imagine so. So how we can pretend that we are most important? So when I start making aquarella, I realize it's absurd. We we have one billion people without water on the planet. One billion people has no access to clean water. In the same time, we have one billion cow, over one billion cow, which needs more water, 30, 10, 10 times more water than people. So it's absurd, right? And to produce food for them. We cut forest, so we already we already at the moment it's already half forest on the planet disappeared because we we produce meat. So slowly, slowly, I came to this conclusion that enough is enough. So we are killing over billion pigs a year. We are killing over half billion cows a year. We are killing over fifty billion chickens a year. We are killing over a trillion fish a year. So I'm not talking about ducks and I'm talking goats and and uh, all alarms. And I'm talking, it's just numbers of billions. So it's absurd, it's total absurd. And we even don't talk about it. We even don't think about it. We ignore it. We know exactly that breakfast didn't appear from the tree. We know, but we pretend we don't know. So it made me think that we're creating our own grave. So when two years ago I was presenting aquarella, I was saying, guys, my call is respect planet, respect nature, respect. Otherwise, nature will punish you, it will punish us. And one year later, pandemic came. So it just, of course, it's absurd. I'm not saying I predicted it or someone else predicted it, but in a way it's connected. Our, our arrogant behavior towards nature, towards everything. For, now I'm doing another movie about architecture and I see how people are making new cities. Do you know what they do? They come into the place, let's say mountains, forest, hills, what they do, they just blow it away. And they don't even ask. Maybe there are dogs there. Maybe there are rats there. There are maybe they don't do any. They just we need to cut forest. Bam. We need to blow away mountains. No problem. We do everything for us. Even when we talk about global warming, how we talk it, how we talk this. This is absurd. We are saying, oh, it will. It will create a lot of migration. It will create a lot of problem for us. Yeah. So we are just talking about us. We everything about us, and this is absurd. This well, is absurd. It's, it's, it's a really good point because we we tend to see human beings as the sort of the superior species on the planet, and we're raised in a society that tells us to think that way. And one of the things that's striking about Gunda is that you are on the level with this pig. There's no humans, so the pig becomes the centerpiece of the story and, and really the lead character. So let's talk a bit about that, because I think prior to this film, if you ask someone to name a famous pig in a movie, they would say Babe immediately. They might still say that, but they might also say Gunda. So how did you cast the centerpiece of this film? All right, it was quite easy, actually. So I realized that I cannot convince any producer because it's difficult for them to understand it. And I said to my producer of this film, I said, listen, let's do it like this. We go to the farm, to any farm, and I show you what we're gonna film. And she said, okay, let's try, let's try. So we made kind of calculations that we will spend 
generally we'll spend four, six months for traveling for research before we will find uh, animals we need. But actually, we found it in the first trip, in the first minute, in the first farm we visit. So we just arrived, we opened the door, and the first pig we saw was Yunda. And I said to the producer, it was obviously she was communicating with me. Like she was definitely looking to me like such ways that I can read her emotions. And I said to the producer, she's Meryl Streep, we found. We don't need to search anymore. Producer is saying, oh, come on, take your time, man. You have time to. I said, no, 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 look, she is exactly what we need. So it was in a way so easy. It was actually, honestly, it was the easiest film in my entire life. Mm. I didn't, yeah, because mainly because, of course, she was quite friendly and we filmed only six hours in total. So to make 90 minutes film, we film only six hours. But also because every day after filming, we felt, all of my team, we felt we are becoming different people. We're becoming different. We're becoming better. Every day of communicating with animals, surprise, like they surprise us every day. Every day we saw they're able to joke, they're able to sacrifice. They're able to help each other. They're able to, to, to smile. They're able to experience freedom. Same way as we do. They're able to be happy. They're able to, to be like, to look like chicken. They, you know, they, they never been outside. They go outside and they yeah. look to the sky and you see how they surprise. So every day we were coming back and we were kind of opening new dimension in our life like ah oh, they can they can experience freedom as we would do they are trying to help each other as we would do they uh, feel empathy as we will do if we have God. <laughs> so they have they are thinking like my le one left chicken was thinking to go left or to go right because here every step is difficult so and we saw she's thinking, she is there, they're trying to find solution when yeah. a lot of mosquitoes, cow, two cows make decision, have to help each other. So every day was just surprise and surprise and surprise. So every day we were coming home, like different people. Like, and I saw my team one by one becoming vegetarian, <laughs> one by one, one by yeah. one. It was so I knew it would work then. Yeah, it was so beautiful. It was so amazing, especially in the end when she, when Gunda, it was very difficult to decide how to film this last episode because if you put camera too close to her, then you will destroy your environment. So you have to be far away, but if you're far away, you can miss all emotions. So, so we were, we knew more or less what could happen, but we didn't know for sure. And from another side, we didn't want to push. We didn't want to make Zoom or we didn't want to make any, what traditionally will people make, like, like to go to concentrate your emotions. So in the end, we found the place and miraculously, I said to my team the day before, she will come to us. She will come to us instead of we going to her, zooming to her. And she came because it was no one to talk to but us. Yeah. There is no one around. So, and she came to express her emotions. She almost said to us, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you doing it? So yeah. you cannot miss it. You cannot, you cannot misinterpret it with her speech, well, right? Yeah, and all of this speaks to part of your production process that may surprise people after they watch the film, uh, which is that you didn't just go to the farm in Chukunda, you built a set to make this film, you controlled a lot of the conditions that we see. So how did you sort of arrive at that approach as opposed to say a more traditional documentary sort of style that would just film on a farm and capture things as they were happening now? Yeah, of course, first, first uh, what ca came to your mind that for the last 30 years, it was quite a lot of movies, the same inten 
um, purpose kind of, but focus was half cruel we are. Like people were show slaughtering house, people were show um, uh, how we torture them, how they live in, in horrible condition, how we take their babies and, and so on and so on. And I realized those films were good, but they did not do job. They did not, they did not change opinion. They did not become cult film. You know, there is no one, you, you, there is no one that stays with you and you cannot forget. So, because people generally saying, don't like when you say to them, aha, you're killers, right? Or, or you're a murderer, or you are not moral, or you are like, so, and this is why I said, okay, we will go opposite. We will go to, let's say, revolution of empathy. Like, we will say, let's look at them, how they are. Not how we behave with them, but how they are. This is why we even didn't use music. So, of course, when you have such final, uh, you, can, it put, you can put violin there and cello and all clients will cry, right? So it will be... But we say, no, we don't push, we don't do propaganda, we don't do vegan propaganda film, we don't do any push, we, we just let people watch. The reason is, what we forgot, in, in my opinion, we forgot one important element of, and I think we have to reconsider it in our education system. So, if you study animal, if you, I, what I do is any, anytime I do new film, I read a lot, I read a lot, right? I read and I talk to best scientists of the world. And then if you read, you, you notice that it's not accidental that most of two, four, four quotes from, from, from how to say, 80% for all information we're getting, we're getting through our eyes. So, so, as animals do. So animals, they look to each other and they immediately see, is it dangerous? Is it friendly? The one you meet now, is it, who is it? Is it one you can make love with or is it someone you have to be far away? So same, same with us. Mm -hmm. We look to each other and we immediately know, is it sympathetic person or mm -hmm, I don't want to, I don't want to have anything with me, right? But we forgot it. So in a way, cinema, documentary specifically, is the closest to, to nature of our animal nature. So nature for a million years of evolution, I don't know how long humans exist in the planet, but it taught us to look and understand. So this is why I said, let's come back to origin of cinema. When you just watch, you just watch and you will feel something you didn't feel before. And this is why cinema exists, especially documentary. Not to tell you story, to show you something, to show you something you didn't see yourself or you don't want to see or you decided not to see. So, because we actually can see it ourselves, but <laughs> it's not convenient <laughs> sometimes right. to see. So this is why we say, okay, we just go and we film animals as the same way with full respect in order to understand them, how they are. And more and more, we, we are coming to idea of empathy. So more every day after filming, every day we, we came to, wow, they feel us and we, because they in the morning, before they start any movement, they were checking us. They were coming to us, smelling us, looking to us, and then first Gunda, and then she made, she looked at us and then she made special noise and kids appear. So first she gave them signs that, okay, it's okay. It's not dangerous, these guys are here, but, no, no problem. So more and more, we became kind of one family. So, and when, when kids was taken, it was tragic for us as well. Well, let's I, talk about that because I think it's, it's worth noting, you, you said earlier, 
that you weren't entirely sure how the film was going to end, but it feels like such a natural ending. Obviously, it's very, it feels very tragic. <sighs> exactly what, what happened there? I mean, did, did Gunda's owners know the kind of film you were making? Because it feels like it's sort of an indictment of her conditions. Yeah, we were quite honest with her. See, the, the reason is the farm is very special, right? The farm is not, not because 99.9 pigs in the planet live in horrible, horrible condition. They live in very small cage in the cement, in, in concrete floor. In the film, you see that they are almost all day digging. You see their nose, they are digging ground. And in reality, they cannot do this. What happened with the owner of the farm, she, she get married and her husband was farmer and this farm was his farm. And she lived with him one year, helped him to, but it was different farm, it was normal farm. And then she said to me, one night I woke him up in the middle of the night and I said, I cannot sleep. I'm crying. We are torturing them. We are mistreating them. Let's change. Let's change. And I convinced my husband, she said, to make 20 meters of free space for every pig. So, so she made, a, she, she kind of pioneer of such kind of farming. And so she was already halfway to, to understand that we need to respect animals. We need to look differently. Of course, she still were producing meat and da 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 da, da and, but she was already halfway to understand that they are they have personality. So, and you see, if you you know you if you have dog or you have cat, you know they have personality. You yeah. you know for sure. And you know that understand, they understand you better than you understand them. So they understand up to 2,000 words. And we understand 10. OK, she wants pee, she wants eat, she wants to go to, for, for run, she wants to play. Well, this is what we understand. But they can understand up to 2,000 words. It's, so they are really intelligent. And, but dogs. It's number seven in, in intelligence ranking. And pigs number two. Pigs yeah. are more intelligent than elephants, than even more intelligent than dolphin, than whale. So it's incredible, but it's this is like this, it's true. So it means what we of course we we didn't know everything what will happen, but we said to her, we are not gonna film you or any other people. We just want to film emotional condition of mother when, when, when one day they will separate from, uh, from her, she will be separated from her kids. And so the owner, without, of course, without such incredible owner of the place, we will never make such film, of course, of course. And also in the film, there are two more places when exceptional, uh, we were filming in, Sanctuaries. You know what it is? Sanctuaries. Not sure. It's it's a it's not a farm. It's like a, in 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 European some I don't know if it's it's exists in the U.S. In some it's European like countries, sanctuary. in some European countries, there are people who who are trying to help animals. So, for example, if car doesn't give milk anymore, normal farmer will bring her to the slaughtery house. And those people waiting in the gate of the lottery house, and they're just saying to farmer, okay, you will sell it to slaughtery house, sell it to me. They, they're buying it, and they bring it to their land, and they give freedom to animal. And so this is how we film episode with chicken. We film it in Wales, in England. And this is how we film episode with these uh, portraits, you know, because in normal life, you cannot come so close to cow or to bull. It's quite, you know, but in sanctuary, animals trust you because they know that humans are good. So, because humans, and that's why you can even film grandmama cow. 
Because, you know, this girl in the film, in the film she is 30 years old. And this is, you see her portrait, and you see how beautiful she is, and you see her eyes full of life and full of like life behind her. So, because you normally don't see grandma cow. They don't live so long in normal farm. So, and so you see, it's a it's combination of probably before it wouldn't be, won't be, impo won't be possible to make this film. But now, condition, for example, I live in Berlin. So when I moved to this apartment five years ago, in my street was one place where you can eat vegetarian food. Five years later, in the same street, we have five vegan restaurants. So this is in Germany. I am sure it's everywhere now. Slowly people getting. It's like, you know, what, what, what a surprise that Leonardo da Vinci said it 500 years ago that to kill animal and to kill human is the same. It's just act of killing. And, and but he said, well, in the end, he said, but it will take time. <laughs> exactly, right? It takes time, but people, people understand. And, and of course, today, if we, <clears throat> it's not about climate change or, or pandemic, or because we are not only killing these billion animals, we have to, we have to freeze them, we have to cut them, we have to transport them, we have to sell them, pack, to pack, make packages, we have to cook them. It's a lot of energy. It's a lot of, uh, it's it's thirty percent of all disaster is coming from this and. That's why I'm saying, of course, it sounds disaster for some countries. For example, if I say, let's stop meat, let's stop meat industry. For 50% for of countries, in the first place, it will look like catastrophe. There are some countries which all their budget based on meat industry. There are 50% of countries in the world. They cannot live without meat industry. But this is only in the first place. If you remember industrial revolution 200 years ago, it was the same. People who, who were working on the land, they didn't want to have any, any tractor as well. You know, they, when, no one wanted to, if, when first train appears, people were against it, right? So we, we are against things, but then we adapted, then we found another solution. And this is time to, to understand that, you know, 200 years ago, in your country and in my country was slavery. Just 200 years ago, right? So yeah. 100 years ago, in my country, in Europe, in Latin America, Indonesia, we were killing millions of people. We were killing, in my country, 50 million people. It was not just they died, no. It was they were killed. So. But then, since then, population triple, triple. Now we are triple more than 170, 80 years, 70 years ago. And we start eating meat a lot, yeah. much more than ever before. In your country, you eat over 100 kilograms of meat, each yeah. of you eating one year. Right. So, we don't think about it. It's slow because it came gradually. It came like it used to be people were eating meat once a week. Then it became more and more, more and more. We became richer. Blah, 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 blah. People come to cities more and more. And tuck, 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 tuck. And suddenly now we didn't notice, but we already 8 billion people almost. And all of us, we are eating so much meat yeah. that it's becoming catastrophe. And I guess it's moral catastrophe because we allow ourselves to, to do torturing actually. We are torturing them, we are mistreating them and we are killing them. And this is why we don't pay attention that we created torturing, we created gun machine, Atom bomb, a uh, novichok, uh, 
So we created concentration camp. This is all belongs to us. Right. This is not belongs to anyone. Let, let me ask you off of that because I think this idea of a moral catastrophe that you bring up is, is a really potent concept. And often in vegan movements, in vegan activism, what you see is an attempt to force people to confront the kind of carnage involved in slaughtering animals in a very explicit way. So, you know, the when PETA gives you a pamphlet, a lot of times you'll see these very graphic photos of a cow being slaughtered and hanging, dangling upside down, all of that kind of stuff. This film doesn't do that. So what was the sort of logic involved in, in sort of pulling back from, I mean, you, you give us empathy, but you don't give us the carnage. Yeah, I, I, um, it's very important what you say, because in fact, it was the moment when Gunda killed her baby, right? And for me, if I would make propaganda film, I will actually cut it out. So if I would make propaganda film, but I said, I cannot judge Gunda. She, she lives on the planet, pigs live on the planet million years before us, how I can, from my point of view, how I can judge why she killed her baby. I know by my knowledge and after reading books, <coughs> I understood that she only have 10 active nipples and she doesn't have enough milk for everyone. And this one was obviously weakest one and he even lost, uh, he, and she, she checked him a few times before she did it. She smelled him, she looked at him quite long. Then she killed him because she knows he will not make it. But of course, if I will do propaganda film, I rather to cut it out. But I say, no, I cannot talk to people who support my vision. I have to talk to everyone. I have to talk to the ones who believe in this and the ones who don't believe in this. So uh, the, the way, and also, this is why I also made it very long shots because when you cut shorter, when you cut, when you make sh uh, fast cut, fast cut, like uh, you kind of, in a way, even you don't have any voiceover, you still tell to people have to, per, per, to you kind of direct perception, right? You 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 direct what they have to understand, and I said no, I should not, I should not, I have to go to. I believe that we have two parts of the brain. Let's say I will, one part I will traditionally, how we say it in, in our Western civilization, we say one part goes to the heart, one, goes, one, one is rational, one goes to emotion. And of course, if you, most of the films start with rational, they immediately in, in second 20, they already give you information in order you understand. In this moment, your brain is activated to understand. Your brain is immediately, aha, I'm receiving information. Mm -hmm. And then maybe later it goes to your heart. Maybe not, maybe it just stay in your brain. You receive all day, all film, you're receiving more and more information, new knowledge. But if you go opposite, if you go directly to your heart, if you just say, no, I don't teach you anything. I don't tell you anything. It's here I am talkative. Here I'm giving you speech about veganism, about moral revolution or ethical uh, uh, revolution of empathy. But in film, I don't say anything. And luckily, most of the people will see film without my speech, without my propaganda speech. They will just watch it because I want that everyone feel it first. And then maybe it will go to brain from heart. Maybe it will go up. And also, I believe any in our opinion always goes with our delusions. You see, we, we have opinion, but we have to uh, remember that opinion goes with delusion. Yeah. And both of them die simultaneously normally. So, uh, that's why if you want to make a movie which will not die, you have to use tools of the language you speak. Like I'm speaking cinema language, mm -hmm. cinema language. Cinema language 
does not use in the in a region does not use narration even right cinema language is in a way it was born just use image and you have to maybe you find story there maybe not so this is the origin of cinema yeah the last thing i want to ask you about may sound a bit superficial after everything that we've discussed today but you have walking phoenix as a executive producer on this film which obviously helps bring some attention to it because people know his work but what was the conversation that you had with him uh when he decided to get involved and and what what was sort of the um the impact you think his involvement has had here yeah it it, it is very interesting story actually so i'm i'm old school filmmaker right i i i'm i mean I have big big ground like uh, I came to studio when I was 17 and I was assistant camera I was cleaning lenses I was putting focus I was pulling dolly I was putting film into magazine and I I was developing uh, footage I was editor for 5 years I was a d- assistant director so I I was in any any before I study before I came to film school and study, I was doing a lot, 10 years, I was doing everything in cinema. And uh, I was privileged to work with very big filmmakers. So, and few of them were very, very like traditional. So they were, they were making motivation speech in the morning. So, so before the shooting, they were saying something like, one of them was funny, he, he used to be football coach and he was saying in the morning, come on, guys, we can do it. Let's do it today. Let's do a great movie today. So, and I was doing kind of same style stuff. I was, but in different mood. I was saying, OK, we came here today to show how beautiful our animals are, to yeah. show how. So I was giving this speech every day, and it's normally uh, when 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 he, Phoenix made his speech in Oscar, yeah, all my team and all people who knows me for years start calling me. Did you write his speech, Victor? I said what? Did you write Phoenix speech on Oscar? <laughs> I said no, I have nothing. To watch it, watch it, and I watch it, and it was exactly my words, like exactly th- this motivation speech in the morning I, I give to my team. So, and this is how uh, Jocelyn Barnes, who, who is producer from New York, she said, okay, this is a strange situation. Let's try to show film to Phoenix in the way it is now. It was a rough cut, it was, uh, so we send it to Phoenix. And he was very nice in a way that he, he without any, Problem. He watched it immediately, and he called me, and his call was amazing because he said, "Finally, someone made it, and we see them. We see them finally. We see them as personalities. We see them uh, as they are." So, so he was very, and then he was very supportive. And then he sent it to Paul Thomas Anderson, and then it became like it became became more and more help from. So of course, you know, I I only can regret that my in my life before I didn't have such friends because yeah, uh, yeah because all my films I made in Europe and I didn't have this. Well, of course, aquarella is different, but before that, all my ideas could be could be. So for example, I made a film about people who were born with me same day. So. I decided to find everyone who were born with me in same day in same city. Yeah. And at that time, without internet, I spent four years, and it was fifty boys and fifty-one girls in Len- in St. Petersburg and Leningrad at that time, born. And I met all of them. So, all ideas are kind of crazy. <laughs> and if I would be with American way of presenting movies, it will be different impact. 
Well, it, it certainly is a good thing that he got involved in, in the sense that certain more people over on our side of the world have noticed this film. And I hope that more people get a chance to see it because it is truly a, a transportive experience. So congratulations again. And thank you for being here. This has been a wonderful conversation. I know I learned a lot just hearing you talk. So. Thank you very much for your time and for your interest. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and stay safe.